Good morning, Southside. Welcome to another day where we get to worship the Lord. And if you're watching online, thank you for joining in. Just let us know where you're worshiping from. And a very blessed good morning to you. Well, I just wanted to start with one thought this morning. As we get ready to worship, I'm reminded of the passage in Acts chapter 2. How everything that the, the disciples believed in looked like it had come to an end. Jesus was dead, or it appeared that Jesus was dead. And nothing seemed to be going right. Life just seemed to go on as usual. But the disciples, for some reason, felt that they needed to pray. And in that prayer, they were able to experience God. And the, the Bible says that the Spirit descended in that time. So this morning, I don't know where you are. I don't know what you're coming in with. I don't know what you're dealing with. But one thing I do know is that if we trust in the words of Jesus, he'll see us through. So I'm going to invite you to stand with us as we pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. Lord, we give you praise. Hallowed be your name. There is no one like you. You are El Shaddai. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are Jehovah Nisi. You are the God who fights our battles, Lord. So this morning, whatever we have come into this place with, whatever we're watching online and the battles that we're dealing with, Lord, Lord, I pray that you would help us to refocus our eyes on you, that you would shift in this moment this morning, God, as we meet here and assemble to pray and to praise your name and to hear our word, Lord. I pray that you would speak to us daily. And not just for us, God, for the world that so desperately needs it, who are harassed and helpless and without a shepherd, God. So this morning, we give you our praise. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Adrian. If you'll remain standing as we begin to worship together this morning. Uh, for those of you online, welcome. We are thankful that you came to join us. If you're able to stand where you are at home even, it helps you to breathe and sing that much better to the Lord. We're going to start off with this, this morning, Help to the Lord. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of 
of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise, get joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet.
as we stand here in the midst today and we think of the situations that we face and we're reminded that Jesus tells us to speak to that mountain, God. So today, we lift up our situations to you, the things that seem to stress us out, the things that stand in the way, the things that distract us, God. We speak to those things and say, go thee into the water mountain. So Father God, we are expectant on you. We trust you, and in this moment, God, we surrender everything it is that stands in the way, whether it be for our emotions, our, our finances, our family, the things that really bother us, God. Thank you that you already know and that you meet us in the place, God. So, Lord, as we surrender these things to you, we say, mountain, go there into the water. And, Father, for our Sunday school today, Lord, we, we pray for our teachers and as they speak the word to the children and teach them from a very young age what it's like to experience God, Lord, I pray that you would just be with them. Lord, I pray that you would be with us all as we navigate 
the dark situations that we face and we look to the light, the rock of our salvation, which is you, Jesus. May you make all things new. And in your name we pray. Amen. Well, church, um, good morning once again. Welcome to Southside Worship Center. My name is Adrian. I'm the youth pastor here. If you're looking online, welcome, welcome, welcome. And this is the part of the service where we like to greet each other and just have a, a time where we can show love on one another. So why don't we just take a moment and just greet each other now. Praise the Lord. be seated. At this time, I'd like to dismiss the children for Sunday school today. So, again, I want to thank you all for your tithes and offerings. The things that the kingdom of God does, or the things that we see, the blessings that come out of your tithes and offerings, really, really do help people. I hear some of the stories from the food bank. I, I see some of the blessings in our community. And thank you so much for your tithes and offerings. It goes very, very, very far. And so there's two ways to give. If you want to give in person, there are um, the ushers here. Just speak to them and give on your way out. Or if you want to give online, just go to southsidewc.com. Hit the give button. It's a, a very quick and easy way to give. Um, this morning, we, we do have two announcements. Um, In-house prayer continues at 645 on Monday nights. Um, Pastor Josh will be back. And if you need prayer, if you want to pray for someone else, like James 5 talks about it. Let those who are sad, let them praise God. Let those who are happy, let them praise God. And sometimes our prayers are a way that we can stand with each other and believe God. And the Bible says that when two are gathered there in agreement, whatever is done on earth will, be, will happen in heaven and vice versa. Amen? Amen. Um, the next announcement is that we have a, a week of prayer that's happening September 12th until the 16th. So as a church, we just want to pray together and believe God. And it's not just um, a once in a while thing, but it's every year we like to center ourselves as we get ready for a very, very busy and um, a time where we just need to press into God more. Amen? And so at this time, I'm going to turn it back to the worship team to lead us in a, another song.
All right, if you'll stand with me one more time just before Pastor Melanie comes to bring the message. Our message today is about um, the personal conflicts that we sometimes face. And this next song talks about those times when we are so down that the only thing we can do is look up to God and say, hold on to me. The best of me is barely breathing. When I'm not somebody, I believe in. Hold on to me. When I miss the light, the night is stolen. When I'm slamming all. may be seated. Good morning, everybody. My name is Melanie. I am one of the pastors serving with the pastoral team, and it is wonderful to see all of you here and joining us online as well. So for those of you who may be joining us for the first time or haven't been here for a while, um, we've been enjoying a series of messages as we've been walking through the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. It's a series that has been called A Time to Rebuild. 
Nehemiah tells the history of God's people as they return from exile to restore Judah. And um, we are going to be talking about the sixth chapter today. The first six chapters are all part of Nehemiah's own memoirs. In our first week of the series, we saw how Nehemiah, an exiled Jew, had risen to a very prominent office in the Persian Empire, where they were being held in captivity. And he learns of the very difficult circumstances of the Jews who have returned to Jerusalem, and he feels a real burden to go back home and lead a rebuilding project there to glorify God. So in the second week, we saw how God really blessed and answered that bold request that Nehemiah had as the king not only allowed him to go to Jerusalem, but he provided him with the necessary supplies and protection. And despite being surrounded by fierce opponents who were living in the area, Nehemiah inspired the people to start rebuilding. And we were inspired to be bold by being in God's will through prayer and through his word. So during the third message of the series, we read the lists of people who had shared the responsibilities for the work. Ordinary people from all walks of life joined in to make this rebuilding possible. And we were challenged to think about what our role is that we can play in building God's kingdom here. Then for the past two weeks, we talked about the difficulties that Nehemiah faced as the Jews began rebuilding the walls. There were problems that were both external and internal. Adversaries from the people who were living in the area after the Jewish people had been exiled, they opposed the work of the rebuilding. And although he had these enemies all around him, Nehemiah constantly encouraged the people to keep focused on rebuilding and to keep focused in prayer. Well, last week, Dr. Josh Samuel brought us an amazing word about the internal struggles that had threatened the rebuilding. The city had social problems, an economic crisis that led some people to be led into slavery or to mortgage all their properties. And that threatened to turn the physical work of rebuilding into a very futile activity. But Nehemiah demonstrated his remarkable leadership by leading the people to make some difficult moral decisions. And we were reminded that the closer that we draw to God, the more we think about what pleases God as opposed to what we can get away with. And we were encouraged to share things that we need to give up in order to glorify God. So now we're all caught up. And this week, we're going to be looking at the personal attacks that Nehemiah faced and how he did not allow these attacks to distract him. As we read from Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 15, in a message entitled, Keeping Your Eyes on the Prize. So before we read, why don't we just take a moment to pray? Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word has the power to convict us, the power to transform us. And God, I just pray even now that your Holy Spirit is going before us, that your Holy Spirit is at work in each of our hearts. I pray that I may get out of the way, that your spirit may just move, and that the message that you want the people here to hear will be the one that is delivered here today, Lord. We thank you for the assurance that your word never returns void. We thank you for all these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Okay, so Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 15. If you are reading, it should also be behind me. When the, word came to, uh, when the word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. 
Why should the work stop while I leave and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message, and each time I gave them the same answer. And then the fifth time, Sanballat sent his aide to me with the same message, and in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem says it's true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you're about to become their king and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now, this report will get back to the king, so come, let us meet together. I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it up out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. One day I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deleah, the son of Mehetabel, who was shut in at his home. He said, let us meet in the house of God inside the temple and let us close the temple's doors because men are coming to kill you by night they are coming to kill you. But I said, should a man like me run away? Or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. I realized that God had not sent him, but that he had prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He had been hired to intimidate me so that I would commit a sin by doing this, and then they would give me a bad name to discredit me. Remember Tobiah and Sambalat, my God, because of what they've done. Remember also the prophet Noadiah and how she and the rest of the prophets have been trying to intimidate me. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. So ends the reading of the word. Well, most of us are familiar with the phrase, keeping your eyes on the prize. It refers to keeping your attention on what it is that you are trying to achieve, even when it is very difficult. While most of us probably know the value of staying the course, runners truly understand its critical importance. That's probably why Paul uses the metaphor of running so often in so many of his letters to encourage his listeners to remain steadfast in their Christian lives. Runners know that even a simple distraction, like looking over your shoulder, can make the difference between winning and losing a race. People watching the British Empire Games, now called the Commonwealth Games, held in Vancouver, saw just that. The British Empire Games at the time had a prestige only slightly less than the Olympics, And the games in 1954 were very special because they brought together the first two men who had ever broken the four-minute mile. This was a feat that had previously been thought to be impossible. Um, That summer, Roger Bannister from England made headlines when he showed the world that the four-minute mile was a mental barrier and not a physical one. And then just a few weeks later, John Landy from Australia bettered Bannister's time. So these games were the first time that these two runners were going to be meeting, and it was already being called the Miracle Mile even before the race was run. You can still see the race on YouTube. Landy takes off very quickly out in front, and he led the way nearly the entire race. As he rounded the last curve, He turned his head slightly to try to locate where Bannister was. Bannister at that point was just a little bit less than two meters behind him, but he was known for his last second spurt of energy. And as Landy turned to look back, two things happened. He broke his stride slightly, and Bannister, who had his eyes firmly fixed on that finish line, swept by on his other shoulder and broke the tape first. On the outside of the stadium where they ran that race was the message that everybody saw that day, keep your eyes on the prize. 
Well, if ever there was somebody who demonstrated a supernatural ability to keep your eyes on the prize, it is Nehemiah in the passage that we just read. At the beginning of the chapter, we are reintroduced to the trio Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem. We met them initially in chapter 2 and then again in chapter 4 as the main political and economic opponents of Nehemiah's activities. And now these representatives of the people groups living in and around the area are seeing that Nehemiah's building project is just about done. All that's left to do is to hang the doors. So Nehemiah's opponents change their tactics here. Rather than threatening, they ask to meet with Nehemiah. Now, this sounds like it could have been a reasonable request, even a prudent request, made by people who realize that God is blessing Nehemiah's building activity and want to all of a sudden make peace after their initial shows of aggression up to this point. And Nehemiah's response taken in that context, I'm sorry, I'm busy with an important work here and I am not coming to talk to you, could sound like it's a bit boastful and haughty. But as we've seen in earlier chapters, Nehemiah is really in tune with God's will. Nehemiah has the gift of discernment. And he recognizes that what sounds like a reasonable request for a political peacemaking is really a plot to do him personal harm. Ono, the place where they wanted to meet, was uh, about 60 kilometers away from Jerusalem, a day's travel from the safety of the city. So at worst, it would have exposed Nehemiah to personal danger away from the safety of the city, and at best, it would have slowed the, or brought to an end the work on the wall. Well, after Nehemiah dis discerns that they actually meant to do him harm, his opponents send the request again and again and again. You have to give them credit. They were persistent in their attempts to distract him. And maybe they were even trying to appeal to his ego by sending so many requests. But Nehemiah refused to be distracted by matters that would take his energy away from the project that he was engaged in to glorify God. Well, when their repeated requests for a meeting were unsuccessful, Nehemiah's enemies changed their strategy. They upped the ante. They go from distraction to defamation. And the messenger comes back with an invitation for the fifth time to go to the summit. But in addition to this request, the messenger carries an unsealed scroll. So what is the significance of this? Um, during this period, a letter was usually written on papyrus or leather, rolled up, tied with a string, and then stamped with a clay seal impression. And that signified its authenticity, but it also kept its contents private. So traveling with an unsealed scroll was an indication that they wanted everybody to be able to see what was inside. In a way, it's sort of the equivalent of publishing the contents of this in the National Enquirer. And as it turns out, it was about as truthful. The letter says, it is reported among the nations. People are saying, don't you know? And Geshem says it's true. Inside sources have confirmed that you are trying to stage a coup. You're plotting to revolt, and that's why you're building this wall. You're trying to be crowned the king, and you've appointed prophets to proclaim you as the ruler. And then comes the blackmail part of it. We will make sure this report gets back to the king that you are trying to revolt. Unless you stop your work now, leave Jerusalem and come to meet with us. Well, gossip doesn't usually cause physical harm to people, but it has probably destroyed more people, tarnished more reputations, broken more friendships, and split more churches than any other sin. But that's another message for another day. For today, it's enough for us to think about how we would react if we were faced with this situation. 
with somebody threatening to intentionally spread a blatant falsehood about us in an effort to undermine our leadership. I think it's safe to say that most of us would probably react and spend a great deal of energy and maybe even try to give back as good as we had gotten in an effort to try to set the record straight. In addition to facing that exact situation, Nehemiah is being faced here with a lie that could potentially terminate his position of favor with the Persian king and end up being imprisoned or tortured um, because he is being called a traitor. And yet, other than taking the time to send a message denouncing the truthfulness of the story, Nehemiah doesn't pay any attention to it whatsoever. He does not let it distract him from his work. Instead, he recognizes the threats for what they are, an effort to affect the work on the wall. And in what we've come to expect from Nehemiah, he prays to God for strength and for guidance. So then we come to the final episode of personal attack on Nehemiah. And I would think it must have been the most disappointing for him. In the face of these attacks by his enemies, Nehemiah visits Shemaiah, who appears to be a priest, someone that he should have been able to trust, someone that he should be able to go to for good counsel, spiritual direction. Instead, Shemaiah tries to frighten him with prophecy and lead him into sin. Again, as we've seen previously, Nehemiah's knowledge of God's word and his discernment help him to recognize easily that even if the prophesied threat against his life was true, that by following Shemaiah's direction, he would be violating the law to hide out in the temple building since, as a layperson, even though he was governor, he was still a layperson, he was not able to enter the sanctuary. The fact that Shemaiah encouraged a course of action that was contrary to God's law revealed him as a false prophet. If Nehemiah had followed that counsel, his leadership would have been discredited by his cowardice and his sin. But Nehemiah was not distracted he kept his eyes on the prize. And the wall was completed in 52 days. A wall that had laid in ruins for well over a century was rebuilt in less than two months once the people were motivated into action and focused away from their distractions. So what should we take from this story, other than the interesting and sometimes shocking historical account of repentance, rebuilding, in the face of political and economic intrigue? How do we learn to keep our eyes on the prize the way Nehemiah did? And what's the prize we should be focused on? Well, I think the first thing that we should take away from this is that each of us needs to take a good, hard look at what it is that is distracting us. What is drawing us away from God's purpose for our lives? What is keeping you from God's best for you? We live in a world that is filled with distractions. Internet, television, social media, everything at our fingertips all the time. And maybe that's what's distracting you. Last week, Josh Samuel talked about the economic issues that the people were facing at the time and how that threatened to derail the work. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's financial issues, job struggles, the inability to figure out how to pay the bills in these challenging times. Maybe we're being distracted by things that appeal to our ego, things that appeal to status. Maybe we're being distracted by fear, like Nehemiah's enemies try to use here. Fear of what people will think of us. Fear of what people will say. Fear of rejection. Fear of failure. I'll tell you right now, that is, has been a huge distraction for me in my life, and it causes me to take on all kinds of things that aren't God's best for me. 
So I think the first thing that we need to apply to our lives from this chapter is prayerfully considering what is distracting us from what God is calling us to. The second thing that I think we need to apply from this chapter is having a mindset of submitting everything to God in the first instance. We're really good at praying, but usually it's after the fact when something's already gone wrong and then we think to turn to God. One of the things that I personally took from this entire series was the way that Nehemiah sought God first in all things. In chapter 1, when he heard the report from the returning Jews, he wept, he mourned, he fasted, he prayed. In chapter 2, when the king asked him, why are you so sad? What do you want to do? He didn't answer the king. He went and he prayed, and then he came back and he answered the king. In chapter 4, when he starts to face the danger from his enemies, he prays. He doesn't react. And today, in our passage today, when he was faced with slander and blackmail, he didn't lose his focus. He prayed. He let God deal with it. We need to have that mindset that Nehemiah does, that mindset of submitting every single thing to God. It's that mindset of Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. The third thing I think we can take from this, and it's pretty closely tied to the second, is to focus on giving God the glory. In verse 15, Nehemiah just has this simple statement, so the wall was completed in 52 days. I'm pretty sure that if this was most of us leading a work that was nothing short of miraculous, rallying the people, getting the permission of the king despite all of this opposition and making it all happen in 52 days, there would be a little bit of pride slipping into the reporting of how this happened. I did some work with some volunteers, with Phyllis and Scott and some, some volunteers in the basement last week and again on Monday. And I'm telling you, I could not wait to drag Howie and Deborah and Maureen down there after prayer on Monday night to show them what we had accomplished. I would love to say that that was about giving God the glory, but it was not. It was about showing off all of our hard work and waiting for the praise for all the things that we had done. Nehemiah undertakes his work to glorify God, and when he is finished, he gives God the glory. When he tells his opponents he won't meet with them, that he's doing a great work. He's not being boastful. He was doing a great work because it was a work that he was doing to glorify God. Paul reminds us of this in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. We don't have to lead a huge and scary building project to do a great work. We can do a great work in our classrooms, in our homes, on our job sites, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, whether we are cleaning or whether we are pastoring, living our lives to and for the glory of God makes it a great work. Well, before I conclude, I, I think it bears saying for six weeks, I've been listening to us talking about Nehemiah rebuilding a wall around Jerusalem. And in Old Testament times, the wall was equated with salvation. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 18. No longer will violence be heard in your land, nor ruin or destruction within your borders, but you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. The wall was a structure that protected, provided security. It represented a place of shelter. It formed a sense of belonging for that community. Now, I don't want to steal Pastor Josh's thunder because he's coming back next week and he's going to finish off this sermon series. But despite 
Nehemiah's great accomplishment, the rebuilding of the wall ended up being a little bit anticlimactic. Despite his best efforts to restore that salvation to God's people, to restore them to community, to transform their circumstances, at the end of the day, it wasn't successful because their hearts were not transformed. A physical structure cannot provide salvation. For that, we needed a real savior. We needed God's own son to give up his rightful place at God's right hand, to live among us, to take our guilt upon him. When Nehemiah was faced with threats and slanders from his opponents, he didn't defend himself. He just spoke the truth and he trusted God. When Jesus was hauled before the Sanhedrin, all kinds of people testified falsely against him. He didn't defend himself. He spoke the truth and he trusted God. When Nehemiah's opponents tried to lure him off of the wall, He chose to stay there and finish the work. When Jesus' enemies challenged him to come down off the cross and to save himself, he stayed on the cross to finish the work of bearing our sin. Nehemiah declared his work on the wall was finished. As Jesus breathed his last breath, He said, it is finished, and it was finished, because three days later, he rose again, and he conquered sin and death forever. It is finished. Jesus lived and died and rose again from the dead so that we can know salvation, so that we can be transformed, so that we can be the people of God and not just have life, but have abundant life and know life everlasting. Nehemiah's example is a great one, a great example of keeping your eyes on the prize. But our prize, that finish line on which we have to keep our gaze fixed, it's not a wall, it's not a church building. Our prize is the kingdom of God. We see that inbreaking of the kingdom during Jesus' ministry with the healing, with the casting out of demons. We see it continued after his death under the power of the Holy Spirit. And we see it today as the gifts of the Spirit continue to demonstrate God's power and God's kingdom here on earth. Our rebuilding project is the role that we play in building God's kingdom here, in building the great witness of God's power through the Holy Spirit, in living as people saved and transformed, in being a community of Christ's people who reflect his love and his holiness, in being the people who tear down the walls, and demonstrate God's mercy and justice to a hurting world. Like Nehemiah, we absolutely need to keep our eyes on the prize because Christ is going to return, and he's going to return soon, and God's kingdom will be fulfilled. And when Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, his disciples were shocked. They questioned why he would even talk to her. They lived in that same system as Nehemiah, where the Samaritan woman was someone to be kept outside of the walls. She was a descendant of Sanballat, the opposition. She was a Samaritan, which made her unclean. She was a woman, so she shouldn't be talking to Jesus. And she was a sinner, just the kind of person that Jesus came to save, just like each one of us. This episode bears witness to the fact that the old system and the kingdom that's ushered in by Jesus' earthly ministry bear little resemblance to each other. Where the disciples saw separation, Jesus saw inclusion. He tells the disciples, simply look up because the harvest is here. Set your eyes on the prize. The ultimate prize will be God's restoration of all things to him. And until Christ returns, we will have trouble. 
there will be opposition, there will be distractions that we face every single day. But when the problems come, when those distractions threaten us, Nehemiah's lessons hold true. We need to, to recognize and address the things that are distracting us from the role we are called to play in building God's kingdom. We need to set our minds on God, and we need to give Him the glory, and we will see the victory. Set your eyes on the prize. Look up. The harvest is here. Amen. Amen. When we come and gather together on a Sunday and also on Mondays as well, and we worship together as a congregation collectively, there's times when I enjoy it so much that I just don't ever want to leave. We're going to sing the song, Nothing Else. Stand with us, we sing. Holy 
As our time together draws to a conclusion, I would just encourage you as you leave this place to go to your homes, your neighborhoods, your workplaces, your schools, to keep your eyes on the prize, keep your eyes on what it is that God is calling you to in the building of his kingdom. We know that there are going to be distractions but keep your eyes on him, focus on him first, and give him the glory for the victory. Christ has done the work for us, and the Holy Spirit is here to encourage us and empower us. And I pray that through all of this, God gives you his perfect peace. Amen.
Thank you. 